Good evening and welcome to tonight's John A. Widso Foundation virtual conversation, Church History and the World, the Missouri Latter-day Saint Experience. I am Richard E. Turley Jr. and I have just returned from a, a week in which I've been traveling to Latter-day Saint Church History sites. I've been in Palmyra where I was two days ago. Yesterday I was in the Kirtland and Hiram area. And today I've been in Cleveland and North Carolina, and then recently returned to Salt Lake City, from which I'm broadcasting right now. Our guest this evening is Alex Baugh, professor and chair of the Department of Church History and Doctrine at Brigham Young University. I will introduce Dr. Baugh more fully in a moment. But before that, I want to mention next month's Church History and the World Conversation, which will focus on the Book of Abraham, the earliest volume of Joseph Smith's published revelations. Our guest for that June 13th event will be Dr. Robin Jensen of the Church History Department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I also want to remind you that our previous conversations, including last month's with Dr. Jennifer Reeder about her book, First, The Life and Faith of, Faith of Emma Smith, are available at the John A. Witso Foundation website, witsofoundation.org. We'd also like to remind you of the format for these conversations. We will begin this evening with a discussion between Dr. Baugh and me. I will pose questions to him to initiate the conversation and move it along. Meanwhile, we invite you as audience members to craft your own questions and put those into the chat section of our broadcast. We'll begin addressing those questions somewhere between halfway through and two thirds of the way through the hour, depending upon how the conversation is going. Now, let me formally introduce Dr. Baugh. Alex Baugh is a professor and chair of the Department of Church History and Doctrine at Brigham Young University, where he has been a full time faculty, faculty member since 1995. He received his bachelor's degree from Brigham Young University, from uh, Utah State University and his master's and PhD degrees from Brigham Young University. Alex specializes in researching and writing about the Missouri period of early Latter-day Saint history, 1831 to 1839. He is the author, editor, or co-editor of 12 books, including three volumes of the document series of the Joseph Smith Papers, documents volumes four, five, and six. In addition, he has published more than 80 historical journal articles, essays, and book chapters. He is a member of the Mormon History Association and the John Whitmer Historical Association, having served as president of the latter in 2006 and 2007. He is also the past editor of Mormon Historical Studies and past co-director of research for the BYU Religious Studies Center. Alex and I have known each other for decades, and I count him as both a friend and a colleague. So Alex, let's talk about Missouri. You spent much of your career focused on Latter-day Saint history, early Latter-day Saint history in Missouri. Why Missouri? Well, that's a, that's a loaded question. Uh, I, uh, I took an interest in it uh, actually beginning uh, about 1979, uh, was, it was in June. I was on a tour uh, coming through Missouri and we stopped in Independence and uh, boy, something hit me there. Uh, I, I, you know, I'd read the Book of Mormon. I'd read the Doctrine and Covenants. Um, I know we've emphasized uh, Zion in the church and what Zion is and, and uh, something, something hit me inside. And I eventually, uh, when I had a chance to start a doctoral program and could do something on the Latter-day Saints in Missouri, I, I chose to kind of uh, do a revisionist history of, of the uh, 1838 uh, conflict. And uh, anyway, I just love Missouri. <laughs> My wife loves it too, but she's uh, uh, been tolerant of me. Uh, she Sometimes she says, Alex, when we go out to uh, Missouri in the summer, it's more like misery. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, you know, it's uh, it's got a destiny. It's got a past. Uh, a historical past, a more historical past in terms of uh, ancient. It has the church history element, and then uh, certainly today it's a, a significant place in our 
and our church, uh, but at the same time, it has a prophetic future. So to me, it kind of covers the whole gambit of, of uh, Earth's history in a sense, and, uh, and the best is yet to come. And I just think it's a fascinating topic to consider and to try to examine and try to understand there, Rick. You mentioned Zion. How did Joseph Smith come to understand the location of, the, of Zion? Yeah, I, I think we have to go right straight to the Book of Mormon. Uh, it's mentioned several times, a lot of Isaiah chapters and other things, but when he came to, he and Oliver came uh, as they were uh, translating up there in the Peter Whitmer Senior Farmhouse in, in uh, well, again, it may have been right there at the, uh, before they went up, but uh, he's definitely uh, in Third Nephi, and he's, uh, they're translating Third Nephi and the Savior's account of his visit there, and the Savior mentions and and uh, takes a whole uh, really uh, Third Nephi chapter twenty one. Uh, he discusses uh, that new Latter Day uh, Zion. Uh, just a couple of verses, if I may. Um, I'm just going to hit, hit a couple. Uh, Third Nephi twenty one. Um, talking about the Gentiles, and they shall assist my people, the remnant of Jacob, and also many of the house of Israel as shall come. That they may build a city, which shall be called the New Jerusalem, and, it shall, and they shall assist my people, that they may be gathered in unto, uh, who are scattered upon all the face of the land, in unto the New Jerusalem. So there's the Savior. Uh, boy, what that had to captivate Joseph and Oliver. I just can't think it didn't. And then, uh, of course, then he's, uh, they move up to translate the uh, rest of this portion and, and the small plates uh, up there at uh, Father Wimmer's home. But uh, third Nephi, or excuse me, uh, Ether, uh, chapter 13, Moroni puts in uh, the uh, prophecies of Ether. <laughs> Uh, I'm looking at Ether 13, verse 4. Behold, Ether saw the days of Christ, and he spake concerning a new Jerusalem upon this land. Verse 6, and that a new Jerusalem should be built up upon this land under the remnant of the seed of Joseph, of which things there has been a type. And uh, I will skip again. Wherefore, the remnant of the house of Joseph shall be built upon this land. It shall be a land of their inheritance. They shall build up a holy city unto the Lord, unto the, like unto Jerusalem of old. And there shall no more be confounded until the end come and the earth shall pass away. I, I just can't think they, they just scratch their heads going, what is this? And, um, and I think we can jump then to the uh, September conference of 1830. Uh, and we've got Hiram Page claiming these revelations. And we kind of go, well, what, was it, what were those revelations about? And in section 29, verse 8, uh, the revelation says that no man knoweth the location of Zion. I, I can't think that Hiram Page wasn't aware of the discussion of Zion in the Book of Mormon, but started giving these revelations and maybe was suggesting where it was. But then that verse says, but no man knoweth, and it will not be revealed right now, but I, I can tell you it's on the borders by the Lamanites. Uh, so it's not surprising that Joseph would then receive the revelation, revelations, I should say, calling our first four missionaries to go to the Lamanites that, uh, that they would consider, uh, you know, uh, preaching the gospel to and trying to fulfill some of the promises made to them that the Book of Mormon uh, tells us in the title pages and other places. And so uh, <laughs> he's going, something's happening, going to happen out there. Uh, he gets section 42 in in uh, Kirtland and says, you know, uh, I'm going to reveal it soon. And then uh, he, he gets section uh, 52 at the June conference, uh, 1831 conference, and the opening verses say, tell him that uh, we're assembling now and uh, here in Kirtland, but uh, he commands them to now get this core of missionaries and to go down, and uh, once you go down there, I'll, I'll show you the land of your inheritance. So uh, it's just kind of a systematic um, uh, exposure to Joseph going, okay, something special about Western Missouri or that region of the country. And, uh, and he finally, of course, goes down there and then 
uh, locates uh, the, the precise location of Zion, I guess you might say. That's kind of a long answer, but, but uh, I think it's rooted in Book of Mormon and of course, modern revelation. And uh, 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 he continues, of course, to reveal more and more about the location of Zion. The Witzel Foundation, which sponsors these conversations, focuses on the church globally. If I, you know, you're talking about Missouri, the United States, if I happen to be someone living in Papua New Guinea or Kitabas or Guyana, why should I be interested in the history of the church in Missouri? Well, I think it, it because it has a future and uh, something's going to happen there uh, before the Savior comes again. There's got to be a pre-millennial establishment of Zion. I think there's, there's no question about that. And there's a, uh, then probably, well, there is, there will be a, a, a millennial Zion and, and a unification of uh, Enoch City. And, uh, oh, by the way, I did kind of, I missed that one point. Joseph learns more about Missouri or uh, Zion uh, when he's uh, translating in December uh, the, the Bible and he's in Moses 7. He learns about Enoch and his city. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, he becomes enamored by how he was able to establish this Zion. And I think that's how he's kind of picturing the future Zion will be, this place of, of uh, holiness, this place of uh, protection, of safety. We get that in section 45, where the righteous from all nations shall be gathered out uh, and come to Zion. So it, it, it has a future implication for the, the global church, there will be gathered unto Zion uh, out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So uh, wherever you live, at some future point, I think there's going to be a, a, a real a, a Zionic uh, experience, if we will. As you know, the idea of gathering to a central location was important in the early period of time because, as Joseph Smith said, its purpose was to build temples. Today, we have temples across the globe. We get Latter-day Saints gather to stakes of Zion around the globe. And we, we used to refer to the center place as Zion. So Salt Lake City was often called Zion as well. Today, can we have Zion across the earth? Absolutely. And again, I think the emphasis is uh, the gathering to the stakes. Uh, I, I just immediately recall President or Elder uh, McConkie's uh, wonderful um, discourse on the gathering place for the Bolivians is a Bolivia and Korea, Korea. Uh, we certainly can establish where, where we can have a stake of Zion. We can have Zion in itself in that, uh, in that sense. So for right now, no, we, we don't need to all gather to one central gathering place because uh, the, the, the way you prepare for that, I believe, is to gather from all uh, throughout the world and gather them to the stakes. And the, the, the hinge, the, the, uh, the uh, cords, so to speak. And then once that is established, you can eventually put the center place into, uh, in, 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 into being. And I think in the early history of the church, of course, the early Latter-day Saints, once they knew where Zion was and were asked to go there, they were certainly uh, anticipating they would be the ones who would actually be there uh, in the full establishment of Zion. But uh, obviously that wasn't the plan, but not the nonetheless, they laid the foundation as we get from uh, uh, sections uh, 57, 58, right in there, 59. They were honored in laying the foundation of Zion, the location, at least establishing an initial location. But for today, we gather to the stakes. There's no need to gather together. We need to spread the gospel throughout the world and and establish stakes throughout the world so as to gather Israel. Uh, and that's, that's obviously President uh, Nelson's scope. Let's gather Israel wherever we can in the world. And then once we have a sufficient base there, let's, uh, let's establish a temple and uh, provide the, all of the blessings of, of the sacred ordinances of the temple. So as, as people who are scattered in these communities across the world, there, I'm sure there's some things that we can learn from the early history of the church in Missouri. So let's start with the earliest period, Jackson County. Talk mm -hmm. to us about that. 
Well, uh, again, Joseph goes down there with these missionaries, and I, I really don't think he uh, understood what would happen down there. He just knows he's supposed to go down there. But I think what's really interesting is once he gets down there, they, they do want to do a couple of things. Now, this is, this is June of 1831. Uh, eventually, a total of 30 uh, missionaries will go down there, and they, they, they do travel separately. They have smaller groups. But he gets down there. And of course, uh, he has a reunion with the missionaries to the Lamanites. Now he's, uh, Parley Pratt has come back to report that they were not successful in ultimately uh, converting large numbers of Lamanites, actually none, but they did, one account says they, record, they, they actually baptized nine people. Well, one of that, some of that group was the Joshua Lewis family. And that's where they kind of headquarter while they're there in Western Missouri and Jackson County. But while he's there, they really do three things. Uh, number one, they, um, they dedicate the land of Zion, and that happens on August 2nd. On August 3rd, Joseph Smith uh, actually dedicates the site which was revealed to him for a temple in Zion. And then on the 4th of August, they have a, a conference, and then they basically uh, fulfilled the revelation. Joseph now knows where it is, there's going to be groups of people coming down, particularly uh, the Colesville group, part of that company included that group. Uh, but for the next three years, uh, Latter-day Saints will gather to the area of Jackson County, establish uh, five major settlements. And within, by 1833, summer of 33, there's about 1,200 Latter-day Saints who've gathered to Western Missouri. And again, their hope and intention is uh, let's let's establish this community that uh, we can be prepared to. Well, they they they're 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 just moving forward with it. They're trying to live the law of consecration. Uh, there's some problems. Uh, problems always result. Uh, they didn't always get along. Uh, people who came down uh, came without having consecrated some of their property, and so they came and just saying, "Well, okay, we're supposed to be here. What do we do now?" And uh, there was, they wondered why Joseph Smith wasn't coming down uh, from Kirtland, if this is Zion. So there was problems, but uh, they had some, uh, uh, you know, they were just kind of trying their very best and doing what they could. They established a newspaper with Phelps, actually two newspapers, the Evening and the Morning Star, and also a more commercial paper called the Upper Missouri Advertiser. Um, they established schools. But unfortunately, uh, things did not work out as they anticipated. And unfortunately, the local citizenry uh, was very skeptical of the Mormon intentions. And I hope you don't mind if I call them as Mormons, but it's a historical term and that's what they referred to us as. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we ran into severe problems uh, uh, by 1833 with the local citizenry. So it sounds like there's some things that people across the globe could learn from the way the early church members down there behaved individually and towards each other. But that wasn't really the cause of their expulsion, right? It was this sort of external force. Tell us a little bit about the external force and what happened to drive them out. Well, first of all, I think we can say there was regional or sectional differences. Uh, Latter Saints came from uh, New York. Uh, New England, Ohio, and uh, they're coming to a very, very different society. Uh, Missouri was one of our, I think it's actually the newest state, I'm trying to think here, was came a state in 1821, and it is the fringes and borders of the, the United States, but the others who had come there before were basically transplanted Southerners, uh, Kentucky and Tennessee, and uh, they were, uh, some of them were slave owners, uh, Latter-day Saints were not abolitionists at the time, but uh, I think the uh, Latter-day Saint, um, to them, the Latter-day Saints threatened their slave culture. Uh, they were worried the Latter-day Saints would perhaps, uh, what's the word, uh, uh, initiate slave uprisings, uh, like Annette Turner's Rebellion in 1831. Uh, so there was those problems. Uh, the Latter-day Saints um, uh, were just a, a different social group. There, there was a kind of a lower class element there. That, that's not to say that there was 
uh, you know, that some of the Missourians were not bright people, but um, they were uh, kind of a lower social class. Joseph Smith later said that they were a hundred years behind the times. Um, the Mormons had the only newspaper press, and so uh, that probably caused some resentment when when Phelps would write and publish uh, articles saying this is the land of Zion and God has given it to us. Uh, there was just all sorts of things. It's kind of like oil and water. We really, really didn't mix, but un the underlying uh, differences, of course, were religious. Uh, Latter-day Saints believed in new scripture, prophetic leadership. Um, uh, they spoke in tongues. They had manifestations of tongues. They believed in visions and healings. And some of these ran counter to some of the uh, uh, sectarian and uh, they, they were, some of these Missourians were not very religious. And, and uh, it's not surprising that some of the, the uh, ones who were religious, that, that, that's where we get the most opposition. I think they saw it as a threat. And, and also politically, uh, by 1833, we had about 1200 Latter-day Saints or Saints there, members there. And uh, politics is gonna play into that. Uh, one one Missourian wrote that it would be only a matter of time that the Latter Day Saint or the Mormons would eventually control the the elections that have enough population to elect their own judges and the civil officers and so on. So there was all sorts of problems uh, from the beginning with the local citizenry and and not really mixing well. So there were cultural differences, religious differences, political differences, all creating a kind of tinder box. What was the spark? that caused the explosion that led to driving the Latter-day Saints from Missouri, or at least from Jackson County, Jackson County. this initial discussion. Well, as I mentioned, they have this uh, press that's the evening and, morning, the evening and the morning star and, and Phelps uh, uh, editorialized in that uh, uh, newspaper. And uh, because slavery was an issue in the United States at that time, and certainly in Missouri, which came in as a result of the Missouri Compromise. It was going to become a slave state uh, there. Uh, he publishes a piece about, it's called Free People of Color. Uh, in that uh, short, short, it was not very long, but he cites a lot of the Missouri laws associated with free slaves or free uh, 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 African-Americans. And, and uh, he's basically saying it's going to be a, It'd be very tough. You better bring credentials, or you'll you'll have a hard time living here. And I think the the local citizenry and and many of the people tried to twist that a little bit and say, oh, uh, they're they're inviting Phelps is inviting and the church is inviting uh, slaves to come here, free slaves. And uh, uh, it 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 sparked it really quickly. And uh, and then of course we have the uh, presb or the uh, ministers. Uh, particularly a Reverend uh, Benton Pixley, who began to instigate uh, 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 problems and saying we need to expel the Mormons and uh, and uh, we just can't live with them and based upon their their strange views and other things. So uh, things got out of hand pretty quickly and with just a matter of weeks, uh, they they uh, come to uh, real problems and uh, we have the. Uh, a group, a large group of uh, Jackson County citizens coming and uh, issuing some ultimatums to Edward Partridge. And Edward Partridge is seen as the figurehead leader of the church there. He was the bishop, of course, and his counselors were uh, Isaac Morley and John Corll. But Phelps was the publisher. Oliver Cowdery was helping him. So was John Whitmer. And uh, so they uh, basically, uh, when the Latter-day Saints uh, told them we, we have no intentions of leaving, uh, they initiated violence. This was uh, July 20th, 1833. Uh, ransacked the printing office of Phelps, uh, tarred and feathered uh, Edward Partridge and uh, Charles Allen, another Latter-day Saint. Uh, three days later, we agreed to um, evacuate the community, the communities, the settlements we had. They gave us time. Um, and we agreed to do that uh, beginning in January of 1832. Uh, give us some time to go out Actually, that was the leaders were, were told that they must leave first, and then the rest of Latter-day Saints had to be out of the county by uh, April of 1832. At that point in time, we had basically uh, a fairly peaceful uh, couple of months, but W.W. Uh, Phelps was not, uh, not content to uh, let that go. 
And uh, he uh, immediately began to try to negotiate some sort of uh, uh, legal action against them. The Latter-day Saints hired four attorneys up in Clay County, just to the north, and uh, received an arrangement, made arrangements with them. It was kind of expensive, a thousand dollars. That was a lot back then. Uh, to have these attorneys uh, kind of begin to uh, initiate a legal process to try to uh, see if we can't uh, change things. Uh, the Latter-day Saints also uh, communicated with the governor, Governor Dunklin, uh, the attorney general of the state, a man by the name of Robert Wells. Uh, these men uh, were appraised of the situation, what had happened. And uh, uh, so they were, and, and in fact, uh, Phelps even uh, put together a packet of materials to, and sent it to President Andrew uh, uh, Jackson. And uh, Jackson passed that on to Lewis Cass, the Secretary of War. And uh, Cass came back and said, we can't do anything for you. States' rights is a state's issue. But these kinds of initiatives, these kinds of actions uh, prompted the uh, citizenry again to say, hey, they're not complying. Uh, we've got to push them out, uh, even before the uh, arrangement. And so beginning the last week of October uh, and the uh, first part of November, uh, they enacted uh, some severe hostilities against Latter-day Saints. And with, uh, by the first, uh, second week of uh, November, almost all of them had sought refuge in uh, Clay County. So as you know, I, part of my background is as a lawyer. And as I've heard you recite these things, and of course, as I've studied them myself, what I've seen then is that there is extra legal violence, or you know what today we call vigilanteism, against the Latter-day Saints, which is not legal, but it often happened in early America when people took the law into their own hands. Yeah. Yeah, vigilante action against the Latter-day Saints. How many people were ever punished for that vigilante action? That's, that's a remarkable thing. In, in every, well, of course, our most, pro, most of our problems happened early there in 1833. And then later, um, we have the same, uh, it, it even much more escalation in, in terms of loss of life and so on in 1838. And uh, yeah, not one, not one Missourian was ever brought to trial for their, uh, the uh, things that they perpetrated against Latter-day Saints. And uh, it's, a, it's a terrible injustice. But I, again, you, you understand this as well, not better than anybody, Rick, uh, state, states' rights prevailed. I, I don't think they looked at the First Amendment and said, uh, uh, legally, that I mean, that, that really wasn't part of the picture, was it? I mean, uh, so, so I think what you're saying, I think what, you, what we're talking about here is that there was extra legal action against letter against the saints in Missouri, vigilanteism, uh, for which no one was ever punished. And they made the, the saints, on the other hand, they tried to use the legal system to get justice, but they were not successful. They appealed to the state and federal governments for assistance in the preservation of their civil rights, and they were not successful there. So what, what we're describing here is a flaw in the American system as it existed at the time. You know, it eventually takes a civil war, civil rights legislation, mm -hmm. and a lot of activism to get to where people's, the rights of minorities of all types, including religious minorities, are protected uh, under the U.S. Constitution, under civil rights, civil rights law. So let, let's talk for a moment. Let's move on to the Saints get driven out of Jackson County. Where do they go next? Well, uh, they go to Clay County, just across the, uh, the the Missouri River. There, they of course uh, ferried across and uh, um, got some help there. The citizens of Clay County were actually uh, uh, quite uh, sympathetic to the Latter Day Saints. Uh, we have a number of them. Uh, that really reached out to our people and uh, helped them secure housing and jobs and so on. Uh, people asked, now again, some went into other counties, but most of them eventually uh, made it to Clay County. And uh, uh, we had some, it's a, it was a different political climate there. Uh, we were, we were most Latter-day Saints were Democrats and Jackson County was Democrats, but that, that wasn't the, 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 the same in Clay County. There was more of a Whig representation, more of a balance, if you will, of uh, Whig and Democrat uh, backgrounds. And uh, in fact, Clay County is named after Henry Clay, <laughs> the great Whig. 
uh, compromiser. And uh, uh, but they were a little more tolerant of of diversity and of the Latter-day Saints there. Now, when they invited them to come, uh, they did so with the idea, of course, eventually we're, we're, we, we need to help you, but we, we hope that at some point in time, you'll, you'll be able to move uh, on to some other location. But economically, the Latter-day Saints were a boon to the county. Uh, they, they employed them, they, uh, it helped their uh, economic base. Uh, it was seen as a positive thing. And, and again, the people themselves were just different. Um, and we have some very prominent, wonderful people. Uh, one historian wrote years later that uh, Clay County just seemed to have an incredibly um, high number of, of good, intelligent, bright people. And I think of the, the attorneys themselves, uh, David Rice Atchison, uh, who was one of the four attorneys employed by Latter-day Saints, uh, he becomes a, a U.S. Senator. He was President Pro Tem of the uh, the uh, U.S. Senate. He, he's a Civil uh, Civil War officer, Confederate, of course, but uh, he he was remarkable. Um, we have uh, Donovan himself. Uh, now Donovan was a Whig, and uh, it, but his father, John, uh, father-in-law John Thornton, was a prestigious uh, Missouri legislator. Uh, but Donovan is, of course, going to be our attorney for the next uh, main, main source of legal counsel for the next six years. Uh, Joseph names his son after him, uh, Alexander Hale Smith. Uh, we have uh, uh, Peter Hardeman Burnett. Uh, he's actually going to uh, work into the law profession, and he is uh, he's the man who defends Joseph, the lawyer who defends Joseph Smith in his final hearing at Gallatin in 1838. And uh, Burnett becomes the first uh, governor of the state of California. There's just a different mix of, of political individuals, and the climate was much different. I, I, I sometimes compare it to uh, Utah County and Salt Lake County. They're distinctively different. You go around the point of the mountain, it's a little bit different. But uh, they, were, they were quite good. And we can only note a couple of uh, incidents in which the citizenry became a little bit alarmed. One was when Zion's camp came, they were a little bit, uh, you know, what's going on here? They were a little bit put off on that. But also right uh, in late 1830, or summer of 1836, they're beginning to feel like maybe with uh, continued Mormon immigration, uh, that th th this, this needs to stop. Uh, by the time the Latter-day Saints leave in 1836 and uh, end up in Northern Missouri, uh, there's over 8,000, uh, uh, population in Clay County, and the Latter-day Saints were about 1,500 at that time. So we represented about 17, 18 percent of the uh, uh, population in Clay County. So it wasn't majority, but or even it was a minority, but they were starting to continue to come now down to uh, Clay County. So that was a different uh, area for the Latter-day Saints. In fact, um, uh, this is where we get the term Jack Mormon. Uh, these were men that were labeled Jack Mormons who helped the Mormons, helped the Latter-day Saints. The, those who were sympathetic, they called them Jack Mormons. So, uh, but Clay County is a, is, is, was a different climate politically and otherwise, and we had relatively uh, good, good relations and, and somewhat peaceful, uh, a peaceful opportunity to be there. The sad thing about all that is, uh, after Zion's camp, uh, the church leaders, uh, while Zion's camp was in Missouri, uh, trying to negotiate some sort of peace after the Zion's camp had come there, uh, Joseph, as they before they left, he organized the Missouri presidency, consisting of David Whitmer as president and uh, W. W. Phelps and John Whitmer as counselors, in, or or counsel, and uh, we call them counselors today, assistants, I guess you'd say, and. Uh, they were uh, they established a high council there, so they kind of formulated an entire uh, 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 council. This would not be a stake. Now later it would be kind of form that kind of a thing, but it was just called the Missouri Presidency and High Council. And uh, the uh, uh, point I want to make is that unfortunately uh, Joseph Smith and Zion's camp uh, basically gave revelation instructing the presidency to. Uh, come to Kirtland for their Zion blessings and so on and so forth. And for much of the period of 1834 to 36, while we're in Clay County, 
the leadership was gone. It was a it was a, a displaced leadership. Phelps goes back to help print uh, the, the new the new uh, newspaper in uh, in Kirtland. Uh, John Whitmer goes and joins him, and and uh, David Whitmer is in Kirtland for nearly three years, almost the whole time. So they were kind of leaderless. They had the high council down there, but but no uh, no real uh, presidency's presence uh, during much of that time. So we're running out of time. Alex, can you just quickly summarize the Saints go from Clay County to Caldwell and other locations? Just quickly explain to us what happens. Well, unfortunately, again, the Clay County citizen said it's time to move on. Uh, it's interesting before we even, uh, uh, before they had kind of come out and said, we really need, it's time you move. Uh, the Latter-day Saints uh, leaders, again, Phelps and others had come down and actually started buying land in what is called what was at that time of an unincorporated part of Ray County, Northern Ray County. And uh, they had procured funds to, uh, to make purchases, land purchases, uh, where the saints could continue to gather uh, into Missouri with the hope and intention eventually of getting uh, the opportunity to go back to Jackson County. But from basically 1836 to 38, we have the gathering of the saints to to Western Missouri, Northern Missouri, I should say, uh, in Caldwell. Now, uh, as we gathered there, again, our attorney, and now uh, by late 1836, Alexander Donovan was also the elected representative from Clay County to the Missouri legislature, and he proposed creating a county for the Mormons, which he did in late 1836, got approval. Wilburn W. Bogg signed it. And uh, we began, uh, uh, that really helped us in terms of actually an established location for the saints. Uh, we could elect our own public officials. We could raise a militia uh, for our own personal protection and uh, it's always to maintain order. And uh, so for a couple of years, things moved along quite well. Latter-day Saints assembled to Caldwell County, but unfortunately things deteriorated in uh, beginning in 1838. And um, some of the apostasy that was in Kirtland kind of carried over. And in Missouri, uh, we lose some of the most incredible leaders we've had in the church in that period. Uh, we lose uh, Oliver Cowdery, John Whitmer. We lose Phelps himself. Uh, we lose William McClellan, um, Frederick G. Williams, uh, a number of them. So we have uh, some inter internal dissension, uh, which causes problems. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the Missourians now, as Joseph Smith flees Kirtland and he comes down and actually moves him, Sidney Rigdon and Hiram Smith, our first presidency, move to Missouri. Uh, that sent a red flag to everyone that uh, during these earlier years, uh, Latter-day Saints were established, the headquarters was in Kirtland. Now with the arrival of the first presidency, uh, they, they recognize that um, that Latter-day Saints are now headquartering in Missouri. That caused a lot of red flags. Uh, the other thing is Latter-day Saints began settling outside Caldwell County. There, it was just a gentleman's agreement that if we create this county for you, you should be expected to all stay there. Well, we began to uh, go into other counties, which caused another red flag. And as these things kind of escalated, uh, we have the... Uh, in, in, in June, uh, June 17th, Sidney Reagan gives a salt sermon saying that we've got to, these descenders are causing us problems. We need to have them leave. And if you don't leave, we'll help you. Uh, that raises a, a, a group called the, the Danites, uh, which many Latter-day Saints are familiar with to try to help facilitate the, uh, the, the expulsion of the, these men who are causing problems. We have the, um, uh, uh, sermon by, uh, again, Sidney Rignan on July 4th. He basically says, now we're here. Uh, we've got a large number of us. Leave us alone. And it, it was very patriotic speech, July 4th. But then in the latter parts of his, his address, he, he gets a little vitrolic and uh, says, uh, if you come against us, we will defend ourselves. We won't, we won't start it, but we will defend. And of course, unfortunately, the, the, uh, this was published and and uh, a number of uh, people said, well, this is a declaration of war. Well, that was not the intention. Uh, but then uh, politics plays into it. And we have several encounters 
uh, and events that lead to eventually the uh, expulsion of the Latter-day Saints. That's, that's a real short synopsis there, Rick. <laughs> Thank but, you, uh, Alex. Uh, we know you're a fount of knowledge and that uh, if we had more time, you could go into much more detail. Let's take questions from our audience. Here's one. Now there are preppers, church members moving to the Missouri area, Gallatin near Adam on Diamond and other places nearby. Why are they moving there now? And what advantages do they see in going there now? That's a good question. We've had, uh, and many are aware of this, uh, uh, there's always been this interest in Missouri, I think for many years. And of course the church came back there, uh, really began to be established again. Uh, in the early part of the uh, 20th century. Um, we had uh, the mission established in independence, uh, the central states mission, uh, or central, ah, I'm trying to think, is that, is that right, Rick? What's central, central? Central states, yeah. And uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the mission president. It was there years. Oh, I just got a blank. Uh, <laughs> uh, Samuel O'Banion. Samuel O'Banion was mission president there for years, so we began to gather back there and establish a mission and small branches. But the fact that it is the main, you know, uh, Zion, the location of Zion, uh, groups have been coming back for years, uh, and in, and individuals themselves. And I think they may, in their own minds, feel like maybe this is uh, in some way preparatory. And it's certainly not uh, something that has been expected that people are supposed to or being asked to do this. It's just kind of on their own. Uh, they feel like maybe this is where we need to, to establish Zion. And, uh, and this is our calling and our purpose. And I guess it's kinds of these, these kinds of people and groups that over the years has kind of really led to a, a, a large, uh, significant gathering of Latter-day Saints in that area. I'm trying to think how many stakes there are in the Kansas City area. There's gotta be at least uh, six or seven and then, uh, so, so I think that's that, uh, just that inherent interest in Zion and saying, well, uh, where should I go? And, and in some ways this has in, in, in increased the numbers of members of the church in that area. And, uh, but it, it's not a, it's certainly not a directive from the, 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 the heads of the church. It's just kind of a, their own um, initiative to go back there feeling like maybe that's where I need to be. I don't see it as a negative thing at all. I, I really see it as a, as a you know, if that's what they feel like they should do, I, I guess that's okay. And I, I think it's important to recognize that many of the members of the church, you know, most of those stakes that we have in Missouri are populated by people who were, were, came into the church and came to Missouri in sort of natural ways. My mother's family, uh, my mother's from Missouri, her family really? proliferated in that area. The small branch to which she belonged in southwestern Missouri eventually becomes a stake itself. And mm -hmm. so there, there are a lot of Latter-day Saints in Missouri today in all parts of Missouri. And it, they, they've come about through missionary work and natural increase and so forth. Here's another mm -hmm. question, Alex. I notice in reading the, the Doctrine and Covenants and the accompanying historical aids as part of Come Follow Me, that 1838 is a pivotal year for many early prominent members of the church, especially the Whitmer family and Oliver Cadbury leaving the main body of the saints. Do you have any insights as to what happened and why? <laughs> well, uh, Rick, you know- uh, in, 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 a, in a nutshell, because I know this is a complicated one, you could spend the rest of the time, we've got more questions. Well, unfortunately, again, some of the apostasy from Kirtland kind of carries over and we lose some key people. We lose the entire Whitmer family, uh, and and uh, and anyone connected to them, Hiram Page and others. They they uh, they're part of that group that uh, make an exit. Um, the Cowdery is another one. That one is a real uh, tough one. But the, another problem is there was some con kind of some contention associated with uh, kind of a kind of a power grab. I don't know how to call it anything else. Uh, Thomas B. Marsh. And uh, David Patton, uh, both uh, members of the Quorum of the Twelve, uh, had some real strong feelings about the leadership of the church in Missouri, particularly Phelps, uh, David Whitmer, and, and John Whitmer. And, uh, and uh, from their, uh, their uh, impetus, uh, they, were, they were able to successfully, if you, I hate to use that word, but they were the ones who kind of spearheaded uh, the, uh, to try to change the leadership. And 
at this point in time, the High Council, uh, really the the both in Kirtland and now in well then in Missouri, uh, the apostles should not did not have ecclesiastical authority outside those two High Council those outside those stakes, if you will, and uh, yet Thomas B. Marsh and and David Patton both felt like uh, they needed to assume that leadership role in Missouri and successfully uh, in their minds anyway. Uh, caused the Whitmers and uh, David or uh, Oliver Cowdery uh, to be uh, removed from their position. The good thing is uh, most of these dissenters did come back, but none of the Whitmers. But uh, Cowdery does, Phelps, uh, Frederick G. Williams, uh, they do come back, and that's a, that's the good part of the story. Thank you, Alex. Now this next question gets at some interesting recent research last few years. The question is. I have heard that some of the violence against the Mormons was timed to prevent them from filing homesteading claims on a specific date, and that the persecutors claimed many of the abandoned properties. Is that true? That's, that's absolutely true. Um, this is uh, particularly true in Davies County. Um, the land was not yet up for a government sale. And so uh, Latter-day Saints who came to Missouri and wanted to or didn't have any property or any land, I should say, any money, uh, could go up and settle in Davies County and uh, claim what we call a preemption claim. And there they could claim up to 160 acres. And you didn't have, there's no payment due at that time. And they could improve the property. And uh, then when the uh, government called, uh, finished the survey and called for uh, land sales, made announcements of land sales, then they would have the first claim on that land. And I'm trying to think of the exact date, but it's around November 20th, 18, uh, November 20th, 1838, that those land uh, sales was coming, uh, as had been announced. So if the, uh, one of the main reasons I think the push against the Latter-day Saints to actually remove them came about was so that they could get them off the property and then they could actually uh, uh, do, you know, it, uh, file the claim for themselves and, and take over some improved property. I think one of the uh, individuals involved in that was uh, Lilburn Boggs' uh, brother. So they could remove the Mormons and just go on the property. And, and then when it came for sale at that time, they could, they could purchase it. So that's a true, that's just kind of a short synopsis, but that, that's a true, uh, a true thing. Yeah. And there's a recent excellent article about that in the last few years that someone wants more information about it. Now, that, that, you're thinking of Jeff? Walker, yes. uh, Jeff Walker's article. Yeah, he, he did a good job. I, I talked about it in my dissertation, but he he uh, he took it to the he, he explains a lot better than I did. Yeah. So read both. Yeah. <laughs> read Alex's dissertation and Jeff's article. Uh, next question: Can you discuss how Missouri affected the Pratts, Orson and Parley? Uh, Orson, not so much. Uh, he, he kind of escapes all the, the problems, but Parley, uh, he just, Parley's in prison. Of course, they're going to get him. They're going to try to uh, convict him because he was a member of the a group known as the Crooked River uh, group that went down to try to rescue three Latter-day Saint men who had been taken prisoner. And while down in that battle called the Battle of Crooked River, uh, Pratt's there. And uh, there was a man killed by the name of Moses Rowland, who was a Missouri militia member. And uh, so the authorities came after Pratt because there was evidence that Parley Pratt may have actually been the one who, who, who had possibly shot uh, Moses Rowland. And so because of that, uh, during the uh, hearings against the Latter-day Saint leaders and others who were involved in some of the uh, activities, uh, they made sure that Parley P. Pratt was arrested, and uh, he will be, uh, he's, he's arrested and uh, confined with Joseph Smith and uh, 64 total prisoners during a hearing uh, in uh, Richmond in November, a two-week hearing there, and then he's placed in, uh, after that hearing, uh, he and uh, several other men were actually uh, placed in prison in Richmond, Missouri, and then they had a change of venue and they're put in Columbia, Missouri and uh, Parley P. Pratt uh, escapes with another uh, couple of fellows, a uh, couple of Latter-day Saints 
in Columbia on July 4th, 1838. So while Joseph Smith and his prisoner companions are in Liberty Jail, uh, Parley's in uh, Richmond Jail and, and Columbia Boone County Jail. So uh, he's in prison a lot longer, these others a lot longer than the, the ones who are in Liberty Jail. But uh, yeah, there was no, no love lost on, uh, on uh, Parley P. Pratt. But the good thing about it is while he was in prison, he wrote a history of the persecutions against Latter-day Saints, which he published once he got out. I'm grateful for that. <laughs> Uh, he 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 fills in details there that uh, is very very important, but it definitely uh, that was a hard time for Parley Parley Parker Pratt. Yeah. Thank you. We're running out of question. Running out of time. Fast. We're running out of questions. So I'm going to skip ahead here. Uh, there's one I think would be a particular interest to our listeners. The the audience member writes: As I visit these historic places, I've always wondered just how the locals feel now, other than the Missouri governor. Has there been any other regret shown? It's so interesting that question came up. I just found out this last week from uh, Tom Farmer, who lives in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, that there's a proposal right now uh, or, or planning to go through the legislature to honor the Latter-day Saints on, I believe it was July 2nd. Now, today's the, this is the 200th anniversary of statehood of Missouri this year, 2021. And they're trying to pick uh, different kinds of uh, things that have happened in Missouri to commemorate those. And apparently there's something in the mix right now, if, if somebody from Missouri is listening, um, that it will be a, a kind of to honor and, and, and rectify, if you will, uh, some of the things that happened while the Missourians, uh, while the Mormons were in Missouri. So, I think there's been a change of kind of attitudes toward the Latter-day Saints. I think just the fact that, again, uh, there's a large establishment of, of good Latter-day Saints who are good citizens uh, have kind of uh, hopefully changed the image of who we are and what we represent. And, uh, and that's got, that, that speaks volumes of the, the, the respect the Latter-day Saint people have, or the uh, Missourians have today for the Latter-day Saints. So, and for those for those who may not be aware of what the Missouri governor did, we're talking about Christopher Bond here. Can you just explain yeah. that briefly? Yeah, uh, of course, in 1976, uh, Christopher Bond rescinded the extermination order of uh, Governor Boggs. I think what's an interesting sidelight there, it was actually issued by him at Stewartsville, uh, Missouri, at a reunion of the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And of course, the reorganized church, now the uh, community, they like to be known by the community of Christ. Uh, they've headquartered there uh, since 19, the 1920s, actually a little bit earlier, but that's when they, their official headquarters moved down there. So he was doing it to kind of uh, uh, appease, I guess you might say, and, and uh, you know, a little peace token of the, 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 the terrible order uh, in, uh, by Boggs in 1838. And, uh, of course, we capitalized on that ourselves, saying, well, that, that's us too. But I think it's interesting. It was actually uh, uh, given by Christopher Bond uh, at, at a setting of uh, reorganized church, uh, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint leaders. But we uh, certainly wanted to be on board with that as well, because that was, you know, that's our shared history. So, um, but that uh, basically, you know, it did away with that law, and, and there was an apology associated with that. Uh, that uh, terrifically terrible order that just was so, so unjust. Let me just add a couple of things about that. One, there's a popular myth, and I've even seen it reflected in recent articles by, by journalists. There's a myth that until Governor Bond did what he did in 1976, you could kill a Latter-day Saint without being punished. That is not true. Mm -hmm. uh, the extermination order did not have long lasting effects the way people think that it did in the sense of being, uh, you know, open season on, on Latter-day Saints. That's just not true. Second, I wanted to mention that uh, a copy of Governor Christopher Bond's order, an original copy, copy was given to President Gordon B. Hinckley. Oh. He kept it in his possession, uh, possession framed for many, many years. And he called me into his office one day, and, and it was rather large, you know, quite large. By the time you take all the pieces and put them in a frame, and he, he basically said, I don't have a space for this, Rick, can you take it? So I took it and I had it in my office for many years before I finally passed it on to 
the archives for including in the in the history of the church. So, well, I wish I wish you would have given it to me, Rick. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I do have to say one more thing about that, and that is that Boggs himself, I don't think that was ever his intention. He said I issued it to prevent the effusion of blood. He he reported to the legislature I didn't intend for them to kill Mormons. We just we want to have them removed. If they don't go, then we'll have to. Do, do more uh, extreme measures, but but uh, that order was somewhat ambiguous at the time. But in his mind, he he didn't want to do that. That was not his intention. So, and I and that actually goes to another question that we have. But let me uh, let me just throw in one sort of related thing. Governor Boggs was on the trail with the Latter Day Saints. You want to say anything about that? No, boy. Yeah, they met up uh, with a group. Uh, he was just a little bit ahead of the uh, the Pioneer Company in '46. Um, it's a problem to think. I should have I should have boned up on that one, uh, but I've written a little bit about that in an article on Governor Boggs. But uh, he was ended. He was uh, going to California. Actually, he was going to Oregon, and then I I think he ended up going uh, south on the uh, California Trail uh, over. And then he uh, he gets to California. Uh, but he was just a little bit ahead of Latter-day Saints, and he was a little bit worried. Uh, I guess it was the year before. Yeah, it would have been the year before, because he's with the Donner Party for a period of time. He meets up with them. Um, but I think he was a little worried the Mormons were going were gonna to kind of catch up to him and uh, uh, do a little retribution. But he ends up uh, uh, over in Northern California and finally uh, settles in the Sonoma area, and he's buried there in Napa. But that, that he was just a little bit ahead of the... Um, the company uh, just a year ahead, but uh, then we came in 46 and he was over there in 45. So uh, yeah, that's true. Thank you. Here, here's another comment and question from a listener. This has been a really informative discussion. Interestingly enough, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Stephen Davis, served as the clerk of the Missouri House of Representatives a few years ago. Now you and I both know Stephen Davis. You want to say anything about that? Well, Steve, I hope he's listening. Uh, Steve's now uh, over in St. Louis, but I just thought how wonderful it was to have some of our Latter-day Saints in, in uh, positions of leadership in uh, Missouri government. And, and uh, uh, I think Steve was a good representative of our church uh, while he was there and uh, he gained a lot of friends and uh, uh, you know, promoted some of the, the interests of the, the, the Latter-day Saints and uh, the archives and so on and so forth. I can't remember who the archivist was at that time, that Steve was there, but uh, he's opened up a lot of things that have given us a lot of good, more good uh, information about some of these, uh, some of what happened with some of the Missouri uh, archives documents about the Mormon War and so on. So Steve's uh, Steve's done it, been a great ambassador uh, for us, and uh, I love Steve and grateful for all he's done. And I just want to reiterate that the church has been growing in Missouri and and getting stronger. That there are many stakes there, active Latter Day Saints. Uh, and many of them in you know, government positions and so forth. So again, contrary to a popular myth that sometimes circulates that Latter-day Saints are not welcome in Missouri, uh, while there are pockets of prejudice as there are in many, many locations, Missouri is uh, for many Latter-day Saints Zion today. Yeah. We wanna thank Alex Baugh for being our guest with us today. And we want to remind you that this conversation as well as our previous conversations are available on the John A. Witzel Foundation website, www.witzelfoundation.org. We want to also remind you of next month's conversation, which will be with Dr. Robin Jensen, a historian with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We thank Alex once again, and thank all of you for listening. We hope you have a good evening.